Now there are certain places in County Clare which are famous for, in fact synonymous with, almost stone and flagstone. The scanner stone, for instance, is unique to the county, it's hard wearing and it's used in a variety of ways, both indoors and outdoors. The scanner stone is still being quarried in the banner and Anya Lally went to meet a family who've had a scanner flagstone quarry in their family for generations now. Liscanor Flagstone Quarries is one of the quarries located in County Clare. This particular quarry, which is based in Rock Mountain, Milltown Malby, is operated by the O'Connor family, who have been quarrying and supplying Liscanor Stone to the Irish market for many years. Liscanor Stone, which is famous for its fossilised markings, is found here and in the surrounding area. Well, this is the famous uh, Liscanor stone it's called a flagstone because it breaks off in these thin layers and each layer is a depositional unit um, this is all comprised of sediment and the sediment would have been deposited here somewhere around 320 million years ago okay so it's a very very old uh, landscape if you like and all the sediment here and as far up at the cliffs of Moher and further south all the way down to Shannon Estuary they were all part of one large delta it has an enormous appeal and it has for had a, a long time. Uh, first of all, the, the thickness of it, it comes in a variety of thicknesses naturally, so you can use it for different purposes. But also, the main feature is the, is the, the pattern that the, these trace fossils have on the surface. They are like a work of art, they're almost like uh, Celtic uh, uh, patterns uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sandstone. Um, but they're completely natural. Um, I know we've, a couple of people have got the idea that, that when they see these things, they're actually man-made or they're hand-carved or something. They're absolutely not. Um, they're formed by organisms burrowing through the mud, and this is just the pattern they leave. Now, for us, obviously, having our, our, our machines, our, our rock breakers, we are able to get down to this level of rock here, which is the main bed of flagstone. Um, once we get to this um, area of flagstone, we basically use the same techniques as my forefather was, would have used, um, namely, a hammer, wedge and a grow bar because as you can see at the front of the, the bench here we have uh, the quarry it's uh, segmented into different in different layers so what we would do is we would drive our wedges in along this layer here and slowly loosening the stone it's a very slow process once we lo loosened the sheet of stone we'd use our, our, our grow bar and, and lever, lever the sheet up and then we would drive in our teleporter and take out um, a sheet of flagstone and bring it back up to the to the sheds where we'd where we, where we process it. It's a very slow process. I mean, if I was to stand over here, I mean, this section here, we started two years ago. So it just gives you an idea, two years from here to here, as to how slow the process is.
Uh, I'm joined here at the Falls Hotel in Ennis Time now by uh, Dr. Eamon Doyle, geologist at the Burn and Cliffs of Moher Geopark. And Eamon, a table of rocks to the uneducated eye, but some fascinating stories in, in what's here in front of us. Um, these an example of, I guess, the fascinating geology and landscape around us. Yeah, we have a huge history of geology here. Um, the rocks in the burn and around the area are less around off to 300 million years old, so it's important to remember that, that we've, uh, you know, the, the burn and the, the Cliffs Moor area has been a long time in the making. And the fossils that we find here tell us really interesting stories about what actually was going on and where we were 300 million years ago. Talk to me about this one first of all, because this is a recent discovery. The first one that you just pointed out there, Gavin, is actually a fossil shark tooth. And for those who can't see, it's about two centimetres uh, in height. And this was found very recently from near Julian. I found it myself. I was very fortunate to find it. Uh, we've never had anything like this found before from this area. So we had these, these sharks swimming in the sea that was Julian uh, 310 million years ago. And in size, it would have been a bit less than a metre, maybe 60 or 70 metres in length, this, this actual shark swimming okay. around the place. Big. Yeah, quite big, yeah. yeah. And it's... It looks like it's embedded in kind of a, again, what looks almost like shale rock or... Exactly, it is in shale and this is just one of the teeth. Um, they are very rare. There's a few others reported from Northern Ireland and then the rest of Europe and UK have them. But in, in Ireland, they're actually very, very rare indeed um, for, this, for this particular age. And that's 315 million years 315 million years has been sitting there. So the shark obviously died and then the rest of the skeleton, because sharks don't have a bony skeleton, their cartilage, that mm. is very difficult to preserve and is very preserved, but the teeth often do get preserved. But this is, this is a, a fascinating find. And this is a similar looking one as well. Then, this yes, this here. is actually found from the same area and this is a spiral shell. So it, it looks like basically a snail, but these were uh, mollusks. So they would have been swimming around in the sea. Um, so they would have been like little octopuses. They would have had tentacles coming out. They would have been jet propelled. They would have been squirting water out and swimming around. And they were active hunters. Uh, so they had eyes and they would have been uh, catching little fish and other swimming organisms. But the fascinating thing is, now that we've found a shark that we know is swimming around there, there, there is a real possibility that the sharks were actually hunting these and eating these. Oh, wow. We have evidence from elsewhere in Europe of the, where they found shark's teeth uh, stuck in these shells. We've nothing quite like that here yet, but the real possibility exists that these guys were predator and prey. <laughs> <laughs> so we've now... There were enemies and now here they are beside each other at the table. Are, yeah, exactly. There's a couple of other bits here as well, just to, to bring our listeners up to speed. Yeah, so these are, these rocks are telling us we were in the sea. So where we were now, of course, we weren't here, we were down near the equator. Yeah. This is a part, so not only was it 315 million years ago, we weren't even where we are now. We were down near the equator and we've since drifted up to where we are over, over the past 300 million years. So a lot of the time it was the sea, but then the sea shallowed for a lot of different reasons. Sediment built out, make a delta, and it became came land and here's proof that we have land because we have fossilized roots which are preserved in the rock. Wow. So we know there was tree like um, plants growing there. They were quite large some of them. They would have been you know, 10, 20 meters high some of these things and there's networks of, of roots preserved in place and of course these roots were growing in what was basically soil mm -hmm. so that tells us there was land. And this then, does this tell us that Iceland used to be a lot closer to us? I'm afraid not, uh, it doesn't, <laughs> but what it does tell us is that this, this is a bit of pumice, so it's volcanic rock that was ejected from a volcano. And this was also found very recently near Doolin, and this has come from a, a, a volcano in Iceland called Katla. And these get distributed around the North Atlantic when Katla erupts, and it's been erupting for the past 8,000 years intermittently. And these ones are found near archaeological evidence, so we know these ones came around 6,000 years ago. And the possibility is that the early humans that were in Clare were picking up these and collecting them and using them to okay. polish. So making materials, making polish and stuff, we know from other locations that they've done. And currently Michael Lynch, the archaeologist, is working on this site to, to try and develop what, what the people are actually doing here. The stories you've explained very well of just four different looking stones in, in, in front of us. But are you still, through this work, learning more about the, the way back history of the area in which we are in now? That's exactly what we're doing. So every little thing that we find helps. And there are other people working on it as well, but it's great that I can go out and, and find material because what I can do then is, is make that available, make that information available to, to, to people. And right on cue, we have just published our latest publication, Stonewater and Ice Geology Trip to the Burn. And that is a guided tour for lots of different sites uh, most of them will have signs up and there's information in that which explains mm -hmm. the whole story in an easy to read format and gives you the most up-to-date information about the geological history. And that brings me to the, the question I wanted to ask you finally. Is there a market or a bigger market, maybe one that's not being exploited, of come to the Burren? I mean, we know that it's got a, a unique landscape, but come to the Burren and learn about 
history from so far back, but actually see it before your eyes. That is one of the big topics of, of the whole Geopark movement, is this education about rock history, earth history. So that's one of the things we're trying to promote. So we'd like to get through this booklet and through educating and through promotion through the local business already there, so they have a full mm. understanding of the thing. So it's through them. So it's people bringing out guides, guided walks, uh, cycling tours, kayaking tours, whatever. They are learning about the geology. So the evening course we have, it's just finished for this year with the Burn Outdoor Education Centre. We had local businesses there coming and learning about the geology. So now they are in a position to develop that and develop their own products. It's fascinating stuff. And it's great to see that people buy into it, spread the word, and then everybody becomes more excited about this area. Yes, it is. And we're doing it through the schools as well. Liston Varna Secondary School are presenting to uh, the, the, the Geopark groups tomorrow in the pavilion. And we've also got the National School Liston Varna uh, posters to promote this as well. So we're going right through the whole thing from schools right through to, to the visitors so, and everybody in between. Professor Raymond Doyle, appreciate the snapshot. Thanks for joining us this You're morning. You're very welcome, Kevin. Thank Thanks. You.